the suffering and the pain of the masses of black people. No one wants to pay reparations. The Jews received over a hundred billion dollars in reparations and gets four billion annually. A Holocaust museum was set up for them on this soil for over two hundred million dollars and they get two, 21 million annually just for operating expenses. But the Catholic Church, the Pope, the Jews, the Arabs, white people in general, no one wants to pay reparations to these, the sons and daughters of Africa. So I speak to them. I don't speak. I speak to them. I don't speak to the family of those two Jews. Me too. Speak to many of them. For me to speak to them. So, to give you a little background about myself, uh, my name is Talib Sauber. I am a attorney. Uh, I have my own firm, the Sauber Firm, located in Greenville. I'm also an activist and a filmmaker. And one of the things that I really take to heart for our people is building community and making sure that we have the institutions that are in place that really help to effectuate and make sure that we advance as a people. Okay. And um, as it pertains to reparations now, and why we're here today, I'm gonna start by reading a bit of a passage from the Willie Lynch letter. When it comes to the breaking of the uncivilized Negro, use the same process, but vary the degree and step up the pressure so as to do a complete reversal of the mind. Take the meanest, most restless Negro, strip him of his clothes in front of the remaining male Negroes, the female and the Negro infant, tar and feather him, tie each leg to a different horse faced in opposite directions, set him afire, and beat both horses to pull him apart in front of the remaining Negroes. The next step is to take a bull whip and beat the remaining Negro male to the point of death in front of the female and the infant. Don't kill him, but put him in fear of God, for he can be useful for future breeding. When people ask us, why is it that we need reparations? Or why is reparations important? This is, this is why. These are the things that our ancestors went through. 
These are things that they had to be subjected to. And going a little bit further, the breeding farms, he talked about the end of that passage, about the breeding farms. Our ancestors were bred. You had, the mothers had to sleep with their children. The fathers had to sleep with their uh, daughters. All these things, that's where the term emapa comes from. But do we know this as a collective community? Let's talk about the Casual Killing Act of 1669 down in Virginia, where the uh, slave the slave master could kill our, our enslaved African ancestors and they get compensated by the government for the loss of property, as we would consider. And then they have uh, the uh, notion to ask us about why we need reparations. All right, insurance companies. How many of y'all heard of Aetna? All right, how many of y'all heard of New York Life Insurance? These are institutions that took out policies on our people when we were enslaved as an African people that still are in existence today. So when they talk about old slavery was so long ago, these institutions are still in existence. Come on. This is how they built their wealth, right? Yes, sir. All right, and our ancestors helped to build this country. We're talking about UNC Chapel Hill. We built build buildings there. Uh, University of Virginia, Monticello, Thomas Jefferson. Come on. You know, um, when it comes to uh, what happened in the South, it wasn't just the South. When we talk about enslavement and we talk about slavery, we're not talking about just one region of the United States because the uh, enslaved Africans would pick the cotton and it would get shipped to the North and the, the North would put it on the global economy. So everybody was a participant in this. It wasn't just one region, it's the whole United States, all right? And at present, again, this whole notion of it was so long ago. Nowadays, our black men incarcerated, it's about almost a million black people incarcerated in jail to this day, you know? We talking about Jim Crow laws that uh, uh, formed into black codes that formed into different type of discrimination and segregation and all these things that happened to us that institutionalized the practice of racism and white supremacy, okay? So this is not, not something that is just so long ago because we still speak in English. Where's the mother tongue? You know, we still don't understand our culture and our heritage as an African people because that was stripped away from us. So we can't allow them to tell us that we don't deserve reparations. We don't re deserve some type of compensation because if you can compensate the European Jews, if you can compensate the Japanese, if you can compensate all these people and not talk about our ma'afra, talk about our reparations and what happened to us as an African people, then you're sadly mistaken. Because right. we're not going to take that, and we're not going to sit down for that. That's and that's right. the reason why we have this. <laughs> Colonial slavery lasted roughly 246 years, but neo-colonial slavery, Come the on. slavery today, still is in existence for 400 years. That's right. 1619 is when they uh, captured uh, and kidnapped us from the shores of Africa and brought us here in America. 400 years of torture. 400 years that have translated into police brutality, un illegal stop and frisk, uh, mass incarceration, uh, gentrification, which is a new colonization, That's right. That's right. you know, healthcare discrimination, the fact that uh, we can't even go to the doc to the hospitals without us uh, losing a toe or losing a finger. We go in for a slight headache. How we, how we uh, walk out with no organs, or do we walk out right. at all? Sometimes. You know? So, I just wanted y'all to understand exactly why we're here, would, to lay the foundation as to why we're here, and I'm gonna get into the actual first, um, the first uh, panelists. And before I do that, remember, this is gonna be broadcast on black-empowerment.com, or it is broadcast on black-empowerment.com, so make sure that you post that, uh, you share that so everybody can tune into it, also on Facebook Live. And um, I want to, before, excuse me, before I get into the panelists now, I want to shout out some of the people who want to be on the second part of the panel. Um, the uh, Mama Kinsey Henry, who it represents in Cobra. Can y'all give her a round of applause? Uh, Pastor, Pastor Shane Sutton, who's before me, he's going to be speaking on the panel. Yes. Give him a round of applause. Mr. Cheeks, John Cheeks, he's going to be on the panel. Sister Jackie Johnson will be on the panel. To get into it, the first person that I want to, yeah. So the first person that I want to introduce on the panel is uh, Mr. Attorney Donald Temple, mm. who's on the far left here. 
So this is a, definitely an attorney after my own heart because he's been practicing for a number of years. Uh, he's based in uh, D.C. and Maryland. He practices in civil rights and human rights. He also does employment discrimination, police misconduct, um, estate disputes, and commercial and civil trial and appellate, appellate litigation. In 1997, you may know him because he was the one that uh, coined the term consumer racism and secured a million dollar uh, settled, what was it, verdict? A million dollar verdict against Eddie Bauer in the United States District Court of Maryland. So his, his practice encompasses uh, police misconduct cases in Prince George's County to help end aggressive police dog biting cases. And then also in 2016, he won a $1.7 million uh, whistleblower jury verdict in the United States District Court for the District of Columbia against the DC office of the fi uh, Chief Financial Officer. So without further ado, uh, Attorney uh, Don Temple, I'm gonna give you the floor. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I want to just take a, a moment of silence to acknowledge uh, not one generation, not two generations, not three generations, not four generations, not five generations, not six generations, not seven generations, not eight generations, not nine generations, not ten generations, not eleven generations, not twelve generations, not thirteen generations, not fourteen generations, not fifteen generations, but 16 to 20 generations of people of African descent who contributed to the development of this country without a single right. So we take a moment of silence. My name is Donald Temple, and I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that I am from the Montague family in Virginia. Our knowledge in our family only goes back to James Montague and Martha Robinson Montague and their four children. We only know that they were slaves because in our ancestral history research we went back to a point where we could not gather documents, but we were able to follow the over 500 descendants of these slaves, uh, then slave uh, children throughout the United States. I'm going to compartmentalize my presentation in this way. The issue of reparations, with all of its fervor, to the extent that we are talking about a government objective, commands us making a case uh, for a national justification for reparations. Now, that case is twofold. It's a substantive case on one hand, and then it is a procedural case on the other. I submit to you today that the question is a dated, antiquated question. The question of reparations is really an 1865 question, not a 20, 2019 question. There are two, I, I can't begin, as the brother <coughs> attempted to do, to give you the anecdotes, the historical anecdotes and justifications. There is a publication in the Matter of Color by Alien Heckebotham, which outlines very carefully uh, the, the laws that were in place throughout the southern states. But what I will do to speak to the death of this nefarious and brutal institution, in one paragraph, and it's timely, in 1852, in Rochester, New York, Frederick Douglass said this in his speech about the meaning of the 4th of July. And he captured 
the institution of slavery in a way that I have never seen. He said, what am I to argue that it is wrong to make men brutes, to rob them of their liberty, to work them without wages, to keep them ignorant of their relations to their fellow men, to beat them with sticks, to flay their flesh with the lash, to load their limbs with arm, to hunt them with dogs, to sell them at auction, to sunder their families, to knock out their teeth, to burn their flesh, to starve them into obedience and submission to their masters, must I argue that a system thus marked with blood and stained with pollution is wrong? No, I will not. That's one component of it. When we talk about this institution and its implications throughout our country, historically, people get chills in different directions about it. I did some thinking just to try to feel out what this issue means and how it benefited so many people who don't look like us, and in particular, in the southern states, but not only the southern states, what it did for the American economy. Yes, tell the truth. And in particular, on this question, the leading proponents of reparations should be the United States senators That's right. from North Carolina and Mississippi and Louisiana Teach. and Alabama Teach. Yes, and Texas and Florida. Teach. But here's a concrete reason why. Hypothetical no. Slave owner X owns 100 slaves. In the course of a week, 100 slaves generate per slave 60 hours. 100 times 60 is 6,000 hours a week. 6,000 hours a week. Let's be a little bit generous. Times 50 for purposes of our math. 600, 6,000 times 50 is how much? 6,000 times 50 is 300,000 hours. One slave plantation, one owner is generating 300,000 hours. Okay, I don't get it. I don't get it. Let's go to 1,000. 1,000 times 300,000. Yes, sir. And the number goes to 300 million hours. I don't get it. I don't get it, Malik. I don't get it. I don't get it. Then let's go to 10,000. The census in 1850 said that there were 3.7 million slaves of African descent in the United States. Let's go to 10,000. 10,000 takes us to a million. Still conservative numbers. Right. A million. A million times to 6,000 6, hours a week. Still a conservative number. Takes us to 3 billion hours of uncompensated labor. Come on. Teach, teach. The uncompensated labor benefited and created levels of wealth, not only in the South. So when people tell us that they, we have an African-American president, that does not take into consideration the trillions of dollars that not only the private landowners earned from the three billion hours but the work and the benefits without taxes as part of this equation, the benefits to the government. We don't need a study to make a case for the history and implications of this institution. It's already been done. When we embrace that fact and Adrian Hickenbotham from Philadelphia, the late Adrian Hickenbottom put his life into docu 
documenting the implications of slavery. But we can't stop there because the legal basis goes a little deeper and I refer you to Dred Scott v. Sanford. And in Scott v. Sanford, Justice Taney gave us the framework for why we should be a specialized minority, if at all, in this country as a category. And why we are distinct in terms of who we are and how we are treated. And this is what he says. The question is simply this. Can a Negro whose ancestors were imported into the country and sold as slaves become a member of the political community formed and brought into existence by the Constitution of the United States? And then he said that includes the descendants of the, that class of Africans that were then in existence. What Taney did by law at the United States Supreme Court level, he projected that the descendants of people of African descent who were slaves would never become citizens or become a part of this country. By that, and in his writing, codifying all those bodies of laws that justified that particular level of subjugation. That's part one of that. When we go to Jim Crow and the post-slavery laws, that's another subject that I don't have a lot enough time to, to, to speak about. And what I want to say is this, in closing, is really for us, we can't afford people to really talk about the why, because we know the why. And we have to figure out a way to talk about the how. And what the how means. And, and that means that we're going to debate and differ. And we're going to have to be strategic about how we move this issue and where we move it. Let me underscore this. We're at a place in this space in history and time with people in government at very high levels whose decision making will affect generations unborn. Yes, sir. That's I practice law in these courts, and I submit to you that one of the number one issues that we face, and people know it, are who are sitting as the judges in this court. That's right. Yes. And so as we examine this issue, I believe that we have to be strategic. I'm glad to see my sister Adwa here, and the work that the National Conference of Black Lawyers is doing on the issue and in COBRA. Uh, which is not new, it's historic. Yes, sir. And, and so I think we've come to a place where notwithstanding how we see the issue and how we frame the issue, that within the framework of the how, the strategy, that we'll figure out a way because as much as we think it is a black American issue, it is an American exactly. issue. Yes, sir. Exactly. Thank you, Attorney Temple. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Leonard Jeffries. Um, there's, there's, I mean, there's so much that can be said about Dr. Jeffries. He's like a master teacher. He studied yes. under Dr. John Henry Clark and Dr. Yosef Benyakinen. Um, and he's just like a historian, our educator, uh, my elder, highly respected. And also to note, if it wasn't for Dr. Jeffries, there would not be no roots in the movie Roots. So without further ado, Dr. Jeffrey. pleasure to join all of you at this historic occasion and as you know um, history is something we have to master we have learned his story if you got a degree from Harvard his story Yale his story Columbia University where I got two degrees his story Georgetown his story but we have to be about history. 
So I'm glad that uh, we've had this occasion. We have to congratulate our leader, outstanding attorney, Malik Zulu Shabazz, has given him an acknowledgement. supported him and the great work he's doing. We are at an important historical point. We've been there before and we've made some progress. But because we didn't have the systems analysis we needed, we got pushed back for lack of knowledge. Now we're coming at it again. And then I rise and we rise. And this is our historical and, and very important point. Uh, brother, good to see you. And, all right. We have our Nigerian in the house, our connection to the Omi of Ife to Yoruba civilization. He said he would be here, and he's here. This is an African in America story. This is an American story. But this is a global story. Yes. This is a universal and cosmic story. Mm -hmm. So we have to understand how serious it is. So I've been given an impossible task. My brother Malik Zulu said we have to, you know, your usual thing of, of following Dr. Clark's instruction, you give a 30 or 40 minute introduction, <laughs> and then you give a three to four hour blast and knock them on there. <laughs> but that's not gonna happen today. But I couldn't go anywhere without my weapons of mass destruction right. of the systems of white supremacy that we have to live with. And honorary whites who have been brought into the system, now they're coming from Asia, all over East Asia, West Asia, Far Asia. And they're coming from, unfortunately, the Middle East. Honorary whiteness is something that we have to be about and you can do it with the documents. I brought this just in case somebody doubted me. Okay. This is one volume. Documents illustrative of the slave trade to America. Elizabeth Dunnan. This is volume two on the 18th century. This is volume one on the 14th century. The beginning of enslavement. These are the documents. These are the live letters. You can read it, you can see it, you can feel it, you can feel the correspondence between those who are funding the sh shipping, those who have made contacts uh, with the uh, various agencies. You can see the letters that they're sending to Cape Coast and Elmina and, and Gore. You, it, it comes alive. History is alive. You can see our ancestors being squeezed into the hole of ships and you can see at the end of it all death and destruction for Africans and profiteering for all of those Europeans and others involved. Right. So we have to nail down the American component because it's key and crucial, but what are you gonna do, leave the Brazilian component alone? Oh no, don't do that, sir. What are you gonna do, leave all of the islands of the West Indies no, alone? It's a system! Oh, and unless you understand that, we can't go but so far. So I wanna show you some of the weapons of mass destruction. I got the big ones here. You know, this will knock you out with this information. So you all have a lot of responsibility. Howard, we got to do something special in terms of the documentation and the understanding. We have to have a, all of our great centers. Think tanks that we can start pulling this information together. Put aside those conflicts that I did this first or this organization was first yes. or you stole this Come from me God. or we have to define it. We've all been defined in the wrong way. We're African people. No matter how you are, you can speak to Jump out, try to learn French, let's talk in French. I'm a favorite to do to Dr. A. They think I'm a long French. Speaking French don't make me a Frenchman. My roots are here, Virginia and Georgia. And we have to understand what roots is all about. In fact, we've got to do a step. I have to do a special study on Alex Haley's roots because I had a half a million dollar grant to support him. And if you knew what happened in the roots process, it would blow your mind. We can't deal with it here, but I'll be damned if I ain't gonna deal with it when the right time comes and the right time has arrived. We need as much support as we can pull together to work together. Individual scholars can't do it. Individual institutions are not enough. Some successful movements 
Even in COBRA has to be expanded universally. So there's an COBRA process that's taking place all over the East United States, but every island in the Caribbean. Even in Canada, you gotta go to Africville and Nova Scotia to see an extension of the enslavement process. And I did an article on that at the anniversary of 1976, dealing with Lord Dunmore. And if you don't know Lord Dunmore, then you don't know the American Revolution process. Lord Dunmore decreed in 1775 the proclamation in Virginia. The Africans who joined in fighting against the enslavers would have their freedom. And so the Dunmore Proclamation has to be put up against the Declaration of Independence, which occurred the year before. You've got to compare Lord Dunmore and his reasons, the governor of Virginia, and Thomas Jefferson and his reasons for the Declaration of Independence. This comparative analysis is what we need. Now, you've got it taking place down in the museum there. A great drama. Why the hell is Thomas Jefferson in the middle of the National America? He needs to be there, but he ain't there by himself. Now, right near him is somebody called Benjamin Banneker. Exactly. Making his claim on Jefferson. Got his document, his proclamation against Jefferson. Got his uh, copy of his almanac. Got his work in studying the movement of the but he also is a founding father because he contributed to laying out Washington, D.C., yeah. which has been seen as an African contribution yeah. to the so-called New World process. And centering it in Washington, D.C. is the Washington Monument that doesn't have a damn thing to do with George Washington. It's stolen history. That's a Tekken. In Egypt, before the great temples, you have the symbol of rebirth and resurrection. It's good that it is in Washington, D.C., because this has to be the basis for our research and resurrection and renaissance, reclaiming our history. So don't stop with a few of the scholars like myself and Dr. Ray Wimbush and Dr. Murphy Asante, Dr. Carr, and our great sisters in their work, Marimbani, Barbara, and Dr. Ross. Let's go to the West Indies. Exactly. Let's snatch a brother exactly. from the island of Tobago, the twin republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Study him! Capitalism and slavery, a concept that you have to have. If you don't see the link between capitalism and slavery, you miss the whole process that we want to deal with. Eric Williams, his PhD dissertation in English, linking capitalism and slavery, not with African inferiority, not with lack of African humanity, but the link between the processes of industrial capitalism, agricultural capitalism, insurance, market capitalism. Mm -hmm. This brother's work was so powerful. And he taught at Howard, had his base in the Caribbean when he took over the nation of the Caribbean. He had to ban his own work. It was too rough. He got to run a nation. He got to deal with the capitalist system. And he had to ban his own work. But he took the PhD and he wanted to give some knowledge to you and me who didn't have his deep knowledge. So he came up with From Columbus to Castro. So when you see his PhD work paired with his work for the general public, Columbus to Castro, his partner, Walter Rodney, did the same thing. PhD on the slavery in the Upper Guinea Coast. But he came up with a general work how Europe underdeveloped Africa. You play with this brother's history, you deal the same thing with Du Bois. Du Bois, first uh, PhD from Harvard. What was it? The suppression of the slave trade. And then he went on with the other great works. This family of scholarship wedded to your movement and understanding gives us the victory. I'm gonna end it with this. Because my brother has put a little something in front of me, but I, I should have. Look, the black man's burden. Yeah. Case sir. We usually think of the white man's burden. Basil Davis. Basil Davis. Yeah. One of the greatest of the white scholars That's who right. put our history together. That's right. Talking about his life and how he got involved in Africa in 1941, and that transformed his life. In the 40s, 1940 because the systems analysis says the change that we are in now comes from the laying down of a 50-year turning point of history. 1945 was the culmination of that. 
1945 to 1995, when we were standing here in Washington with a million or two of us before the Washington Monument with our great minister, Farrakhan, leading our way. 1945 is a 50-year turning point of history in our favor. If we look through history, I usually use three 50-year turning points of history. 19 BC, 1400 to 1300, you have what they call a 50-year turning point of history, represented by the 18th dynasty in Egypt, that great dynasty of the Pharaoh Agnaten and his mother, Queen T, and Amenophis III. And then they brought in Nefertiti to be a part of it, and then popping out of the womb was King Tut. We need to study that dynasty, not in terms of individuals and gold masks and trinkets and whatnot. What was the revolutionary process there? When Akhenaten came up with the concept, we need to leave the city of 100 gates and go upriver, go, go toward the delta, and create a new city of God. That's the philosophy of, of Akhenaten. But that was also the philosophy after 1945 of Nkrumah, a new city, uh, and uh, of Ufagbani, a new city, of Sekutore, a Cite Etan. There was a whole consciousness of our people moving into this new nationalism and this new nations to create something special. But all of it was polluted by this capitalist exploitation and this greed and this domination of our mind. But all that's changed. And I'm leaving you with it. We're on a victorious path. Yes, we are. If we follow Frederick Douglass' path and understand, there is no progress mm -hmm. without struggle. Exactly. Those who profess the favor of freedom and deprecate agitation are men who want the crops without piling up the ground. They want the rain without the thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. This struggle may be a moral one, but it may be a physical one. But it must be a struggle. Why? Because power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did. It never will. Right. So brothers and sisters, let's stand powerfully together on the world stage. Like it's, this is this is why we say it's a, a pillar of information and knowledge in the community. Dr. Jeffries, give him one more hand. So next up, next up, now this is a heavyweight panel, y'all. So next up we have Dr. Mustafa Ansari. He uh, founded the American Institute of Human Rights, now known as the Afro Descendant Institute of Human Rights, where he teaches um, the UN Human Rights Defenders. The trustee of the Bosnian genocide case, where he gained an expertise in war and peace issues. An international lawyer, you all. Give it up for Dr. Uh, Mustafa Ansari. Thank you, Dr. Jeffries. Greetings, family. Greetings. I'm, I'm so delighted to be here and to greet everyone here with peace and blessings and also to acknowledge all of the ancestors that are in the room with us right now. All of those 20 generations that are, go back all the time to the beginning in 1492. And I'd and I like to say that there's two uh, uh, catalysts for us to look at. And I'm going to bring you into the mind of an international lawyer for about five minutes. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about the how and to who owes us. The how we're going to do this is by looking at the rule of law of all the laws of nations. Reparations has been defined. It's been defined in the UN Declaration on, on the basic uh, rights of people who have been victims and in, in crimes against humanity and harms. That's already been defined. There's, been a, there's about 20 different types of reparations. I'm going to talk about the first, the, the main four, and you can put some of those into, the, into that, is restitution. Restitution is a heavy one, so let me just, I'm going to restitution, uh, compensation, rehabilitation, and a guarantee of non-repetition. Those are the four main uh, 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 terms of, rep of reparations. Restitution is a heavy one because we talked about it and, and one, of, one of my colleagues who, was, who went to the same law school, Donald Temple, talked about 
the billion, the millions of, of hours of labor, labor is not free, the millions of hours of labor that it caused to build this superpower. This superpower owes us what? According to the rule of law, restitution is a gains-based remedy. That means all the things that the United States gained by, by, because of our labor has to come back to us. So what did we build? We built a superpower. So what is our restitution? That means that we should become a nation, a superpower within a superpower. We built this superpower, and that gain was an illegal gain based upon illegal gotten goods, illegal gotten labor, illegal, illegal gotten murderous and treachery. So it's a gains-based remedy. Now, the remedy has to be on international law. It should be resolved in a way that would cause minimal disruption of the working of the state, while at the same time repairing the people who has been damaged. So how can we affect reparations? The first thing that you give to a man who has been enslaved, or a man who's enslaved and, and, and colonized, is his liberty. The first thing that we are entitled to is our liberty, just by giving us our liberty. So we want to test, because uh, recently we we, reju we rejoined in COBRA uh, with their approach to go to Congress for a study. And uh, we want to add to that. We want to put fire to that. We want to have enabling legislation with that. The enabling legislation is to test Congress. There's, there's four things we want to test them with. We want to test them with status recognition. We want to be recognized for who we are. That recognition of status puts us into the category of people. Now we have a juridical personality. We can bring our claims anywhere in the international world because now we are a people. Right now we're not people. The American law has made us individuals. Have not made it. We can't even bring a, this action as a collective action because we're not a collective. So the first thing that we need to be is a collective. That will allow us to be able to answer all those silly questions. Well, how are you going to tell who's going to get reparations, who's going to get Who's going and who's and how are you going to distribute it? Because we have a parliament, we have a parliament of our people that have been recognized not only by you but by the other countries of the world. So status is a threshold process. So along with HR 40, we want we have proposed HR 41. HR 41 is a status bill. It allows us it allows us to become a collective. That takes away the argument about who's going to get reparations because it's up to us to decide who is entitled to reparations. It's up to us to decide and, and, and craft the program to heal us. We're in terrible shape right now. In fact, we have to do this right away because by 2023 we will have a net worth of zero. We will be have returned back to a slavery state. So we have to do this now. So we're going to put Congress, and I hate to use these words, but it's the truth. We're going to put them on a short leash. The lease may be six months. You have to act within six months because if you don't, we're going to act. We're going to act in the streets. We're going to oh. act everywhere that we can get in order to make this happen. I suggest you. Every man, woman, and child has to act. From the age of seven years old, we have to teach a seven-year-old child his, who he is and how and what he deserves in his reparations. Every man, woman, and child has to throw a punch in this struggle because at the legal end of it, we can act. We can get your judgments. But it's not even. It's not difficult. The United States has already admitted guilt. They've already apologized. They already have confessed. That's not even a private issue. Our issue is now. Let's come to the table and talk. So now, number two is, is HR 42. We want a hundred million dollars to put up election apparatuses so that we can elect our identity. Who are we? Are we Afro-descendants? Are we Afro-Americans? Are we just want to be Americans? What kind of status? This was not given to us in 1865, so 1865 is a, a time when they just let us loose and said, we're going to subsume you into our jurisdiction. That's an act of war. You cannot subsume a people into your jurisdiction. That's an act of war. We have been at war with these people since inception, but especially since 1865, because you didn't, they didn't give us a choice. When they did give us a choice, our minister said, 
18 minute, uh, ministers, said, we rather be independent because the enmity that has that is drawn between your people and our people will not allow us to live together. And it's true. We cannot live under the authority anymore. That's reparation. To move from this status to a status where we are independent is reparations. That's 40% of reparations because why? We live in a superpower that we built and our economy is $1.4 trillion a year that we can't grasp because we're not a collective. We can't heal our people because we're not a collective. We can't police our people. We can't educate our children because we're not a collective. We should be in charge of school. We should be in charge of the police. We should be in charge of everything that involves our people. Anytime that we think, anytime that we allow that other man to be in control of us is a problem. He should never be in control. That's reparations. The first thing that we want is liberty. And that's the first thing under the Declaration the UN Declaration is liberty. So we want to test the Congress with H.R. 40. We're going to give it to uh, the Black Congressional Congress. We're going to give it to Sheila Lee Jackson because we've already written it. We've already written H.R. 41, the $100 million electoral apparatus bill. We've already written H.R. 40, 45, which is a recovery act because we're in such a critical uh, position right now that we don't have time to wait for them to act. We just don't have that time. So we, uh, the, we're asking for $2 billion right now for emergency services because our people in these cities and in the Mississippi Delta are living like they're in the third world. We don't have them. We're living paycheck to paycheck. So we want to test Congress. $2 billion is nothing. The figures that, that Donald Trump uh, came up with was in the trillions. Mm -hmm. And I, we, we prognosticate that our recovery is in the 30 to 50 trillion dollar range, or maybe more. We're not sure yet to put our economists on it. But $2 billion that we're asking in HR 42 is nothing. So we want to test Congress, and Congress has to give us a, sh a show of good faith. If they do not put the $100 million on the table within six months, they don't, put the, they don't talk about it seriously within six months. They just slough it off. If Mitch McConnell or whoever it is, Donald Trump, that's interesting, he, if he fluffs us off, then we go to number two because any time that has anything has ever happened in this country, anything in the world, it has become by demand. So we have to get on the streets seven, from, from, the, from the age of seven years old. We have to get out there. We have to fight. This is going to have to go to the point of civil disobedience. This is right. It's going to have to go there. Because if it goes there, what we'll do with you, we'll bring you into an emerging state and we'll get recognition and we'll get funds from the rest of the countries in the world to make this happen because we deserve it. Thank you very much. My name is Dr. Amy Jenkins. Um, I am the chair of the Movement for Black Power. Uh, are we fired up yet? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 You know, we ready for true liberation? Yeah. Right. Black Power, right? Oh. And you know, one thing I want to say is that when people are sitting up here writing and, 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 and showing, I mean, putting it on their phone, that means you're motivated. You know, this, this forum is not just about coming here to listen. Those who really want the message and really want reparations done today, write, you're writing about it. You're figuring out a game plan. This is what this is about. It's about strategy. You know, for, for what we had previously, it's just been talk. But right now, we need to have a little bit more than talk. We need to have some action and some action plans. And I love to see this happening with our people. Black power? Black power. Black power. So we're going to go ahead and continue it because with reparations, we can't just do this on policy alone. We can't just do it with all talk. We got to have the legal minds in this, all right? So one of the things like we heard from attorney, we heard from attorney uh, Unstoppa Musari, Mustafa Musari, we also have to hear from other legal minds. We heard from attorney Talib Saber, but there's, it's so important that we continue with it. But not only that, we gotta have someone who really, really, really understands the law, right? And we need someone who really is gonna break this down beyond a, a measure where we can't even pretty much, for the ordinary man, we may not be able to comprehend every segment of it. But I tell you what, we have somebody that's gonna do that for you because attorney Malik Zulu Shabazz uh, is not only an attorney from Black Lawyers for Justice, but he's a 
when I say a black lawyer, I'm talking about a strong fist black lawyer. Come on. All right, black power? Black power. You know, see, see, this is the thing we don't understand. We got a lot of attorneys in the industry. Come on. But every attorney ain't working for your interests. Right. All right, black power? Black but we got some people that are trained and then seasoned. All right, seasoned in the fight and the war for their people. And attorney Malik Zulu Shabazz, that is exactly what he does. That's this right. brother works day in and day out for the people. I cry tears for the sweat that goes off his back for fighting for black men and black women. Black power? Black power. So I'm going to go ahead and give him a round of applause for throwing this conference, throwing this bill, and standing on the line for what matters, which is reparations today, reparations tomorrow, and reparations for Black power? Black power. Attorney Malik Zulu Shabazz. Come on, y'all. Right, let's give uh, uh, Dr. Amy Jenkins a strong hand. Please. Let's give attorney and Dr. Mustafa Ansari a strong hand for his presentation. Let's give a young fiery attorney, Alan Saber, a strong hand for his participation in this. Let's give our veteran civil rights, human rights freedom fighter, Donald Temple, attorney, a strong hand. Let's give our master teacher, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, a strong hand. We got representatives from the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America in COBRA. Let's give them a strong hand here. From the Church of God in Christ and People Can Change Ministries, representing Christian family who supports reparations, Pastor Ted Sutton is here. Yeah. Miss Jackie Johnson from Sister and Miss Jackie Johnson from Profile Africa, who's connected with the African Union, who is watching here today. Let's give her a hand. We yeah, have Mr. John Cheeks for the American Recovery Act, a form of reparations. He's here. You'll hear from them shortly. Dashaun Farad, the great journalist, and others, and most importantly, you who are here in this audience and those who are here watching. Uh, again, my name is Malik Shabazz, Malik Zulu Shabazz. And we gotta thank the New Black Panther Party. We have to thank the New Black Panther Party for securing us. And we thank the chairman of the New Black Panther Party, my successor in that position, Chairman Hashim Nzinga, our thoughts and prayers are with him in this house. Trust me, they're going to come right in handy as we move towards Mitch McConnell's doorstep That's right, man. this evening. We'll talk about that in a few moments. Is that Greg Carr? Yes, it is. We got the great professor from Howard University, my alma mater, Professor Carr. Give him a hand. We got to have you say something when we open up. We'll just here, brother. Love you. All right, let's get down to business. I won't be long, I won't be, but I must be strong because I want to open up, allow this panel to be asked questions, and then to include our others in this educational forum and town hall meeting. Such an important time, more than an event, more than an event. Today, this is a program of strategic necessity, a program of strategic Give us a minute. I'll call you first. Just give us a minute for the Hebrew Israel. Um, a program and a strategic meeting whose time has come. Yes. I want to thought off, start off by thanking Queen Mother Moore. Yes. Yes. I want to thank Mario Bedelli. I want to thank all of those legends who fought for this policy, who fought for reparations when it wasn't popular, who have fought, labored, organized in the darkest of times. And now that this issue is getting greater light, I want to say that we must respect and appreciate our elders. This is nothing new that is coming about today. We're happy to try to take this a step forth further. Sister Aju Ayatoro, National Conference of Black Lawyers, my honor to see you and others. In the book of Genesis, in the 15th chapter, in the 13th verse, it is written that God promises Abram, know of a surety, that thy seed would be strangers in a land that is not their home, 
and they, talking about us, they shall serve them, and they shall afflict them for, for 400 years. Listen. And after that time that they have served, the book talking says, I, God, will come to judge that nation that they have served. <clears throat> we first must establish that no other people in the annals of time of the history of the planet Earth we can find no other people that have been in bondage for 400 years under actual slavery other than the black people of the Western Hemisphere. There are no other people That's right. That's right, sir. That's right. that have been in bondage for over 400 years but us. And we are the fulfillers of that scripture. Reparations being talked about everywhere now. Yes. Reparations on CNN. Reparations on MSNBC. Reparations being talked about in circles and quarters that never have before. Is this by man's uh, uh, proclamation or is this coming from a higher source? Hmm. Does the discussion of reparations come from Cory Booker? Mm -hmm. Does it come from Kamala Harris? Ancestry. Or is there something higher that is moving in the waters amongst our people, all of them? That's right. All of them that is bringing us to a higher threshold in this hour. First thing I want to say is reparations is nothing to play with. Come on. That's right. That's not. That this is not a hot subject matter. This is not something temporary. This is not something that's going to be, uh, that should be talked about, met about on the agenda for 2019. And it might go another direction in 2020, not to be heard from in 2021. This is much too serious to play with. We're talking about our lives. We're talking about a fact that a permanent underclass, a permanent underclass amongst our people has developed where this huge and tremendous wealth gap may never, ever, 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 ever be closed. But what our people have and what they need to survive as dignified human beings with human rights, that if we don't act now, that these gaps, these are uh, these major issues that we have, that they would never ever be systematically cured. H.R. 40, House Resolution proposing the study of reparations. And on June 19, how many were in Congress? On June 19, we were at Congress for a historic hearing. And I want to say that that historic hearing and process is a good start. Yes. It's a good start, but we can't stop it. That she may call and the hearing is not specifically to our liking. Still, we want to say that we support a black woman who was under death threats and all kind of threats right now for raising this timely issue and helping to put this, these, let these bills and legislation before Congress. Now, so that's just a start. Our suffering is not an issue to be played with. We're here on election, the eve of election 2020. And part of this momentum comes about because politicians who are running for office in 2020 have mentioned reparations. Yeah. They have said that they support reparations. Uh, uh, even some that we're totally surprised at that would, that would be in front of reparations, such as Senator Cory Booker, now I have to be honest with you, you may have a different opinion, but he's the, the, the least person that I would think would be behind pushing any form of reparations in the United States Senate. Senate is Cory Booker, am I right? That's right. Because Cory Booker has what? He supported Israel. He's a strong, as he says, he's a strident supporter of Israel and other causes that we are, that we are not in support of. However, we're talking about how this issue comes about. It comes about because he is a senator in the United States Senate and he's pushing H.R. 40 on the Senate floor. Now, election 2020, I, 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 I say this is not an issue to be played with. This is not something that, uh, some say that the Democratic Party is, is flouting reparations as a recruiting tool for votes. 
that the Democratic Party is not serious about reparations, but they're throwing out the idea of reparations to somehow wrap up the, the black vote in their efforts to uh, overcome Donald Trump next fall. We want to warn the Democratic Party, yeah. and we want to warn any of our brothers and sisters in the Democratic Party. We don't, we don't know if that's true. We, we hope that that's not true. We hope that, this is, that that's just something that people are saying, that it's not true. But we want to let the Democratic Party know that our people are not to be played with any longer. Yes, sir. The Democratic Party has played with the, with the black vote. The Democratic Party has uh, 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 misused our people. They have made us promises in the primaries, promises coming up to elections only to turn heels and to diss the loyal black voter electorate once that Democratic candidate or platform comes into office and reparations is not an issue that we can play with. We're talking about our lives. We're talking about the lives of our grandmothers and our ancestors that were snuffed out and ruined. We're talking about something really that could never be compensated for. That's right. The level of humili humiliation, torture, and embarrassment that our mothers and our fathers and our grandmothers and our grandfathers Come suffered, you, you could never give me a damn check for that. Come on. Come on. That's right. I wouldn't accept a check for that. We're not to be played with. That's right. And you can't play with God's business. That's right. And God's people. That's right. I won't be long. I just want to throw these ideas out here. You say, I'm feeling the burn, I'm feeling the burn. Well, where is Bernie Sanders <laughs> on reparations? You say, You're no. against it. Me against it. talking about those amongst us that backing Bernie Sanders, you're running out there flying the Bernie Sanders uh, uh, flag. Well, where is Bernie Sanders on reparations? Burn out. Since he's so liberal, since he's so progressive, since he's such a democratic socialist, Point it out. where is he on an issue that's core to you if you're going to back him? Right. Right. Kamala Harris, senator. Now she's a, she gave a, a, a strong debate performance the other night. I mean, she's, she's impressive in speech, she's aggressive, she's quick on her feet. We had to admit that in her performance at the democratic mm -hmm. debate the other night, Kamala Harris came out swinging. Yes, sir. But oh boy. However, but, how, upon how, further how, investigation the female into this particular mom. candidate, mm -hmm. well, first of all, we have to let's just go through all the positives, a few positives. <laughs> she also has been on the record saying that she supports the idea of reparations. She's also a contributor to this conversation <laughs> that has wrapped up the momentum around this issue and Kamala Harris is rising in the polls. Yeah. We want to uh, uh, say to Ms. Harris, we understand all, we appreciate what you're doing. Oh. And as a black woman, we want you to do well. However, your history as a prosecutor raises many questions that we must have answers yes, before we can get behind you. Yes, yes. that's right. Mm -hmm. And point, your speech at APAC, Ooh, yes. ooh. Okay. The Jewish lobby, or the Zionist lobby, your speech at APEC, mm. which chose to compare our, uh, our, our specific plight and our cause yeah. with the Zionists, right. yeah, right. more so than with the Palestinians and others. Mm -hmm. Or otherwise, Ms. Senator uh, Harris, pledging loyalty to Israel yes, certainly worries us because that's going to present a contradiction if you're serious about reparations. Right. Hello? I don't know if my panelists would agree with me, fellow panelists would agree with me, but I say a hard line need to be held. I say no reparations, no vote. You're not for reparations for my people, I'm not going to be a whore for your vote any longer. Promising me some minority set aside, so or a small business plan or packet, or like Joe Biden, try to make us just drive us to vote for you out of fear for Donald Trump. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Oh Biden, <laughs> dancing with the dancing back and forth with the Confederate flag and mm -hmm. whatever his strategy is. Oh Biden, history of Delaware. Biden can't be trusted. 
Right. Biden is not only against reparations, he seems to be against most of what we believe in yeah. upon further investigation into his history and background. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mitch McConnell, mm -hmm. as I conclude, okay. Senator Mitch McConnell. There's a rhyme with that, I won't say it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to keep it all clean and dignified. Yes, we probably thinking the same but thing. You know where I was headed. Right. Sorry. That's how he acts. And that's why he says, not only he's a leading, a leading person in the Senate with influence over this bill if it happens to come before the United States Senate. Here's McConnell says that the election of Barack Obama is a sufficient remedy for what our people have suffered for over 400 years. Oh my. Now that would be an aberration. That would, that would maybe seem to be an isolated comment. If we didn't know, it probably represented the mindset of much of white America. Yes, it did. It represents the mindset of much of white America. Donald Trump is 25 Democratic Party candidates trying to compete against an almost uncontested Donald Trump. Why is Donald Trump uncontested? Why is the Democratic Party trying to take 25 people and find out can they elect one man, right. one person right. over the Democratic Party? Why are they so confused? Right. Why has Donald Trump with all of his errors, all of his mistakes, all of his racism, all of his arrogance, why is he ten, Why is he all odds on favor to win again? It's because that Donald Trump mindset, that white supremacist mindset is heavy, heavy entrenched in America right now. So, you're up for a fight. You're up for a fight. You say you want reparations? You think us presenting uh, at Congress some nice compelling testimony, some nice documents, a nice argument, do you think that is going to convince the white man to, uh, to voluntarily hand us over? $17 trillion or more in damages, it's not going to come voluntarily. It's not going to come voluntarily. When Brown versus Board of Education, they said that that repaired the damage in education, but it did not. We are still separate and we're still unequal. The 1964 Civil Rights Act was supposed to bring us equality in the political field, and that was supposed to equal the playing field. Did it equal the playing field? <laughs> now, in the 60s, those gains that we got, those civil rights gains and other gains beyond civil rights, they were fought, they were bled, yes. they were died for, yep. and they were even killed for. Yes. Right. Yes. You had this country roiling like never before yes, sir. on civil rights issues. Mm -hmm. And the question is, what will you do on the most compelling human rights issue of your generation? Mm -hmm. Yes. In the 60s, Frederick Douglass, correctly, teaches us power concedes nothing without a demand. Right. I argue to today that nothing will be handed to us. Nobody is going to hand us reparations. That's right. That's right. Even though it's owed to us, nobody is going to give us, nobody is going to give you anything unless you force them to do it. That's right. right. Unless you put them in a position that they have no viable alternative but to do it. And we want to know, do you have the strength for that kind of fight in this hour? Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, we're just playing here. Otherwise, we're having a nice discussion there. And if the enemy changes the discussion, we'll be on to another discussion. Because too many people think we are people to be played with, and it's time to show the world that we are not a people to be played with. And this is the issue. I'm showing them that we are not people to be played with. No one is going to give us anything. We must have a united front. In COBRA, we must have a united front for reparations. The persons in uh, uh, in government, in politics, that are pushing for reparations, we here, and panelists at this forum, this coalition we're building, 
Our contention is we must have a united front. Yes. Nation of Islam, who are listening, under Minister Louis Farrakhan, mm -hmm. we must have a united front. That's right. Nation of Islam, under the Honorable Silas Muhammad, mm -hmm. who has fought for this cause for a long, long time, we respect it. Yeah. We must have a united front. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ados, mm -hmm. right. American descendant of slaves, right. we're some of that too. We must have a united front. No one is going to give us anything. In the civil rights movement, they had to go through Montgomery. Come on, huh? Four girls were blown up in the church in uh, 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 in the South behind this cause in Birmingham. Medgar Evers killed, martyred for this cause. Many martyred for this cause. Watts blew up. Detroit blew up. Cities across America went up in flame for, for equality and civil rights and the goals we fought for in the 60s and the 70s. Will we as a generation be allowed to escape with less? Mm -hmm. mm, that is my question in this hour. And as I leave you, well, as I advocate again, we have to fight on a common front as Minister Malcolm X teaches us. Malcolm X teaches that we must have a common front. We must repair all of the errors that allow us to be divided and manipulated mm -hmm. by our former slave masters. Yes. We are partially in this condition because an enemy came to Africa and allowed us to be divided and manipulated against each other. Yes. We are still in this condition, thwarted from our ultimate aims and development because we have allowed not only the enemy to divide us against each other, we have allowed competition. Mm -hmm. We have allowed jealousy. Yes. We have allowed envy. Yes. We have allowed pettiness. Yes. We have allowed triteness yes. to creep in amongst our best amongst us and keep us divided That's right. from the ultimate goal. That's right. And we are not going to let it happen in this hour. And I pledge not to let it happen. Mm -hmm. And so I say in this hour, for all of those who were drowned, in the lakes, the rivers, brooks, and streams. Mm -hmm. For all of those bodies mm -hmm. that are strewn at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Yes, sir. For all of the humiliation and the embarrassment, countless acts of humiliation, embarrassment, torture, and denial of opportunity that our people have suffered. Yes. I say, let us unite. Yes. Let us unite. And let's be ready to fight. And like Marcus Garvey said, up, you mighty nation. You can accomplish what you will. Black power? Black power. We want reparations. What do we want? Reparations. When do we want it? Now. What do we want? Reparations. When do we want it? Now. All right. I know I took longer than five minutes, but not too much longer. All right, we're going to get right into it. We got questions. We got others who are going to join the discussion, but we want to get right into the questions here right now. Mr. Israel. You have a question, you can you can raise hand, I'll call on you from here. We're going to get right into our dialogue. Shalom and greetings, uh, the panel and esteemed guests. Uh, I just wanted to uh, add a little something to the old debate of the number. According to my research, I'm going to publish on Facebook now that I'm out of Facebook prison. That the figures should actually be higher. Speak up, sir. The figures should actually be higher because right before the end of the Civil War, a lot of the slave owners began to put their monies into Swiss bank accounts and moved them into specialized derivatives. And these derivatives are still multiplying to this very day. Last time I just checked on my phone, they're worth about 2.5 quadrillion dollars. And the Pentagon slipped away with $21 trillion in the past 17 years. So I think we deserve about maybe roughly somewhere between 300 to 400 trillion dollars on a conservative side, just based upon basic accounting methodologies by the big six accounting firms, when you scroll in all the dollars, 
of all the funds that have been invested in insurance companies mm -hmm. that have moved offshore from Hartford, Connecticut into the Cayman Islands and other places, we need to come back and reverse those funds and list them out and have them spreadsheeted out and see dollar for dollar what these families had to, what they had ripped off and are still benefiting from <coughs> and still to this very day are collecting royalty checks off of our enslaved ancestors to this very minute and they get payments every quarter off of our backs and, 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 um, and sweat and tears. Thank All right. you very much. All right, let's give them a hand for the question. I think what the question on the table here is the is the damages question. Yes. Or the dollar amount question. Dollar amount. He's questioning the dollar amount question. We read here online where Sister can you put that in for me? Thank you. We read online. Uh, we read and had research where calculations have been up to 17 trillion and so forth. Um, we have a big discussion going on about whether it's individual or collective reparations. There's a whole group out there that just say, just give me a check. Don't tell me what to do with my money. I'm going to buy me a Cadillac. I'm going to buy me some, I've heard brother say that I'm going to buy me a Cadillac. I'm going to buy me some gold teeth. Give me my check and get out of my business. Other people, other others have what I call more mature ideas. Anyway, on the question of damages, Mr. Temple, would you like to uh, respond? I don't think that we can quantify at this point in time what those damages are unless there is an actual study based on some particular elements of what those damages are. The damages are substantial. We can talk about that on one hand, and it also depends on what it means, whether it's not just individual or, or group, and whether it's institutional, and how that's going to be resolved. I right. mean, uh, and we look at history, you can look and compare, for example, a Marshall Plan to a Japanese reparations scenario. We have to be creative and figure out that. But I will say this, though, while I have the mic, though, because Malik and I do disagree on a number of things. And I think that we have to understand where we are in terms of 2019 and 2020. And a fundamental question is going to be what your list, litmus test is in the presidential election. I don't agree with Malik that the litmus test should be, as he said, and we talked about it, and I told him I would say that, because I think that understanding the administration where we are, and I really am speaking for the masses of people in this country who are dispossessed, and particularly people of African descent. I know whatever happens, we cannot afford to create any scenario where this president is re-elected. And, and, and on top of that, whether it's in COBRA or NCBL or whoever, we have to be very sophisticated and very strategic about what's happening. We are at war in this regard. And how we choose our battles and how we think don't depend on my agenda or your agenda or your agenda or Malik, your agenda. It depends on the best interest of our community. This is my brother. I've done things with them, and I will continue to do things with them because we are brothers. But when we have this discussion among ourselves, I want to delineate something for you as we think through this. There is reparations, and there's self-determination. And like a Venn diagram, reparations and self-determination come to an intersection where they are collaborative. And we have to talk about, I don't know what Encobra uh, is thinking in terms of the legislative strategy. When I say there's not a need for a study, I'm thinking about the history of the law and what the law has established and the work that has been done. Some things you don't have to study. And if we were people of another race on some of these issues, we, we don't have to, the Japanese reparations issue, the Japanese did their own study. You understand? And so we need to understand what that means. And then we're talking about, and, and the brother from my own law school. Direct question. Direct I'm, 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 question. Let me finish one thing. Yes, sir. One finish. The brother from my own law school. I asked this question. Where, from where is the money coming? So whether it's a billion or whether it's 150 million or 100 trillion, 
We have to begin to process this information and be strategic about well, these let me, you, let me ask you direct. Where is the money coming? Just say the bill. I'll, I'll get to you soon. Okay. What, if it's seventeen trillion, where is it coming from? Let, let me give you two quick answers from my thinking. First of all, I think that black people of African descent, going back to Dred Scott and Justice Taney, Justice Taney chronicled a category of people of African descent whose ancestors were sold into slavery, and we agree that that should be a special category. Black people of African descent, therefore, from a tax point of view, I don't think that people in that category should be at the same, they should be at a different tax implication because there should be a way that we should have to pay for taxes and we get that one way. There's gonna to have to be some question about, for me, uh, how whether you deal with the question institutionally. I think hundreds of billions of dollars need to be reinvested in our academic institutions. I think that today, we can say that we're gonna to put today while this issue is being studied, $250 billion into historically black colleges and universities and make sure the poorest black people of that category have access to that education. We can say today, while the issue is being studied, that because of the discrimination, particularly in the South, particularly in the South and those targeted states where you have disproportionate educational systems, that $250 billion can go into these elementary and, and, and high schools today without much study. So when you give the larger question, we got to figure that out. All right. So let me ask, let me move. To, give my hand. And let me ask you. I'm sorry. Do you agree with this 17 trillion dollar figure that has been put out there? If 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 whether you agree with the figure or not, how do you see? Uh, uh, where do you see reparations? How do you see it being distributed? Where do you see it coming from? Thank you for the, thank you for Here. the question. Here, can I have that? Thank you. Dear brother, thank you for the question. Uh, this is this is our position as international lawyers. Uh, the and I agree with Don Temple, my, my alumni associate and colleague over, over there, is because we don't have definitive numbers. So HR, and I was explaining what HR 41 was, was a status change bill. HR 43 is a $12 million bill. $12 million, that's all. We need economists to look at uh, at our assets and evaluate our assets and also determine for us what we need to spend our money to heal our people on. We need a labor, I know we, they, so far they told me we need a labor intensive economy because a lot of our people have not got the skills, of our, our highly skilled, so we need a labor intensive economy. So that question is, 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 is an open one until we get enough money to be able to put our, our own economies to give us a study and an economic plan for all of our cities and all of our people. The second thing, the second part of your question, where is the money coming from? You guys say it's coming from Congress. Uh, eventually, maybe it will be, but this is our alternative right now, what's on the table right now. If we choose to enter, and, and I want to go back to the Venn diagram, because there is an intersection between reparations and self-determination. If we choose self-determination, I'm going to tell you what the Palestinians get per year from the, from the rest of the countries of the world. They get six billion dollars for their infrastructure. We need infrastructure money right now. If we can't get Congress to move in the next six months, damn it, we have to go international. And we have to be called a nation. Yes. We wasted fifteen million dollars on fifteen million, excuse me, fifteen million votes on Hillary Clinton and her failed election. We wasted sixteen million dollars on, on President Obama didn't give us a doggone thing. We need two million declarations to say that we want to be an independent people. If you cannot do that, then you don't deserve reparations. We have to be independent. We have to be up, up, up under authority of these people. If we do that, then we can obtain about 10 to 12 billions of dollars in the next year or so, of more or less, from the other countries of the world because we are in an emerging nation status. This puts leverage on the United States because when they lose us, they lose credit rating because we are an important part of cog of this country. So 12, so if we, if one million of us decided to become a nation, 
they lose one million, they use billions and trillions, they use billions of dollars in the economy. That's our leverage to make the United States come to the table. Do we, should we pay taxes? If we decided not to pay taxes, that would also decrease their credit rating. We have to become a collective because the collective nation with inside this nation can only make those choices. We have to grow to that understanding. We have to get out of this relationship that's very abusive.